Uh, our next guest this morning was the Director of Engineering of, and New Product Development of Entex. They were best known for their handhelds and uh, most famously the Adventure Vision. And uh, he's uh, entitled his talk, Walking with Dinosaurs. And uh, he'll be happy to answer any questions at the end or along the way at his choosing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's Mike Rounds. Good morning. My name is Mike Rounds. I'd like to welcome you. It's such a pleasure to be here. Tomorrow, Steve Wozniak is going to be speaking, and today I'm speaking, and this makes a great dichotomy. Steve Wozniak is a man who's in who's who, and I'm listed in who's he. <laughs> you guys have never heard of me. Well, let me tell you who Mike Rounds is. I was the director of engineering and new product development for Entex, one of the premier handheld game companies during the 1980s. And these are pictures of me in my office, and you can see the Entex Rondell up there and some of the products, including one of our competitive games up there, uh, the Coleco Pac-Man. We'll tell you a bit about that here today. My business is project management. I'm what's known as a master project manager. I wrote the book for Prentice Hall on how to manage projects, and that's why I was hired at Entex was to come in and manage projects, because during the early days of the handheld development, the toy business really didn't know anything about electronics. Now, my background for getting into the toy business was probably absolutely perfect. I had been the program manager on the training system for the Red Eye and the Stinger guided missile system. I taught the Marines, the Army, and the Secret Service how to shoot airplanes out of the sky. So this made a natural adjunct. I figured if I could blow up stuff in the aerospace industry, I could blow it up in the toy industry, too. But that was one of the projects that I worked on. I'd also been the director of engineering for one of the Fortune 500 companies. So when I was hired, it wasn't only because of my background as a Marine officer and because of that, but because of the technology that I was going to bring into the toy business. During my tenure with the toy business, these are a lot of the toys and games that I managed or helped develop, including that little fuzzy guy in my hand, Teddy Ruxpin. I worked for Don Kingsborough. I set up the original Far East Engineering and Operations for Don Kingsborough. He moved me to Hong Kong. And a little later on, you'll see something very interesting. You'll see a picture of Teddy sitting on the original drawings and blueprints that I still own. They're on 8.5 by 11 sheets. I got those from the inventors. I actually work with them. And you'll notice a number of games up there that you'll recognize. And these were some of the things. In fact, there's Teddy sitting on his little drawings. And those are not available for sale or copy, by the way. Those are the originals. Okay, what did I bring to the party? Well, I brought the technology to a company who had never done anything like this before. Single chip microprocessors, microprocessor generated sound effects, speech synthesis, rechargeable batteries, and LCD technology, just to name a few. Keep in mind that prior to the 1980s, most of the toy companies were pretty rude, crude, and elementary with the things that they did. So what's an Entex and who was the company? It was a toy company that existed from 1965 to 1984. They were probably most famous before the electronic days for their model kits. We made the handheld models of the Lusitania, the Titanic, the Spruce Goose, the Space Shuttle, all the very big models, the John Player Special. And what they were most renowned for was their see-through model of the Wankel engine. When Mazda came out with the rotary engine, Entex made the model kit. We were also the second largest manufacturer of construction blocks in the world. Lego was number one, Entex was number two. We manufactured a line of blocks called Lock Blocks that were under license from Kawada in Japan, and we licensed them to Sears under the name of Bricks Blocks. And we were the number two manufacturer. We made electronic handheld games, and we actually tried our hand at making video games. And you'll see some of that stuff here today. Now. Here's a question. What makes something valuable? Everybody thinks that these old games are valuable. What makes things valuable? Who knows? Scarcity, Scarcity that's one. Perception. Perception, that's two. What's the third? Okay. Public acknowledgement, that's the, the first one right there. Okay. Scarcity is number two. But the third has to do with the intrigue and the stories surrounding it. Years ago, I had a friend that was a stamp collector, and he told me that if a stamp has a lot of intrigue around it, regardless of its level of scarcity, it's more valuable. In fact, if it has murders connected with it, it's more valuable than any other. Now, I don't know that any of our handheld games have any murders connected with them, although I know a lot of people that wanted to kill me while I was there, but they are scarce and they are somewhat valuable. Entex was a company that was founded in 1969 by Tony Clues. And there's a picture of the rotary engine and the lock blocks up there. 
We became a world leader in 1980, and we had worldwide sales of about $100 million. Now, it's best known in video game circles for the incredible line of handheld games that we produced, including Space Invaders, which we did one point. Three million of, I believe, and it was the game of the year in 1980, plus Adventure Vision, and we're going to talk to you a bit about that today. I know that that's the Holy Grail. There's a picture of Tony Clues, there's a Space Invader, and there's the model of the Spruce Goose. And you're seeing pictures and archives and stuff up here that most people have never seen before. Tony came from Eldon. And prior to the electronic game industry, the hot, quote-unquote, electronic or electromechanical product was slot cars. And this was Eldon's Road Race. So Tony had a grounding in the slot car industry and a background in electronics and electromechanical. So unlike the other people in our company, Tony wasn't afraid to push the envelope of technology. Most of the people at Entex who had been there since the start of it believed in old-fashioned games, electromechanical, maybe a little battery-operated motor, but simply injection-molded plastic or wood. Now here's a little trivia background. The Entex logo was created for us by Ben Templeton, the man who draws Motley's Crew, the syndicated newspaper column. The RAF Rondell was used because Tony was in the RAF, and that little caricature in there is actually a caricature of Tony Clues, that little happy face. That's where that came from. In 1980, actually 1979, late 78, Entex elected to get into electronic games. Now, as I mentioned, there has to be some drama involved, so let's give you some players. First of all, down in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see Tony Clues. To his right, you'll see me. Above me is Kaji Harasan, the hardware-software designer at our Intex Tokyo office. And up in the top right is Sunio Hanzawa. He was the president of Intex Tokyo. We had opposite offices on opposite ends of the world. And this particular picture was taken on the bullet train between Tokyo and Osaka, and you can see my briefcase up there with the Entex Rondell on it. There's some players at Entex that most people don't know about. Rick Dyer was one of the people who used to design for us. When Rick got out of college, he had one job and decided he wanted to work for himself, so he created a company in Pomona, California called AMS, Advanced Microcomputer System, and he hired a bunch of young, sharp, hardware software designers. And Rick had a contract with us, and we paid him, I've forgotten how many thousands of dollars a month, but we got right of first refusal on everything that he and his engineers invented. And they invented a lot of things, a lot of toys, a lot of games, and they did a lot of programming for us. So a lot of those games that you see in the other room that say Entex on them were actually programmed by Rick Dyer and his crew. There are some other players that you'll learn more about. There's a guy, and I can't find their pictures anymore. There's a gentleman by the name of Bob McCaslin. Bob is the man who invented Adventure Vision. It's based on a patent that he holds, and the man that did the programming is Steve Meadows. Now, Bob and Steve are still working together. They're in a company in Santa Monica, and Bob is the classic form of an inventor, and he fell into what every inventor wants. He found an investor. He found an angel. And this woman funded him into a company called McToy. And all Bob had to do was invent. And he's still pretty much in doing that. Now, they're not doing toys anymore, but they're still doing inventing. Mike Hennig and Dan Schiffman are responsible for the LCD games. And you'll learn a little bit more about them as we go along. Mike was the concept designer, and Dan Schiffman was the software programmer. There's some very famous players. Larry Carr and Andy Barber went on to do a lot of very exciting things for Atari, and they were also responsible for one of the early Hayes modems. Don Baker was responsible for the rotating mechanism inside of the Adventure Vision game, and Don was the project manager on the gun turret on the A6 gunship. We went for the big guys to help us make this thing work. Okay. Let's take a look at the background of the playing field. Around 1975 to 1977, depending on who you talk to, Entex dominated, or sorry, Mattel dominated the electronic handheld field. They had the baseball game, they had the electronic road race game, and I believe they had a modification on the road race called Buck Rogers. I think they modified the game and repackaged it to that standpoint. Between 1978 and 1979, everybody else in the toy industry took a look around and said, well, Mattel is selling about three-quarters of a million each of these games every year, and they're a sellout, and everybody will sell their soul to get one. Do you think there might be a market for this? And everybody went, duh. Please keep in mind that at this particular juncture, the toy industry was not very sophisticated. Their idea of high-tech was to put a point on a stick. 
So along comes this handheld electronic thing, and it scared most of the people in the toy business to death. Now, I'm not talking about the people that did Vectrex or the people at Atari. I'm talking about people who had been making classic, traditional games, toys, fuzzy dolls, etc. Now, here's some shots of Toy Fair in New York City. For those of you who are not familiar with how Toy Fair works, Toy Fair is two converted hotels on Fifth Avenue and Avenue of the Americas in New York City. It's across from the Flatiron Building. And since they're converted hotel suites, you have to pay for them all year round, even though you only use them for about three or four weeks out of the year. So what happens is late December, early January, all the carpenters and the painters and the decorators move in, and they redesign the suite with all of the displays for all of the toys. And 80% of the toy buying for the year is done on or about February 15th at Toy Fair. And these are shots of our booth at Toy Fair. And you can see some of the different games. There's the Space Invader and the 3D Road Race. And down the lower right-hand corner, you can see a banner down there that says, We've got them all. And that particular motto was very important to the rapid growth of Entex. Now... One of the things that we did after we started licensing the rights to arcade games is at Toy Fair, and you can see there's a shot of Toy Fair, we actually had the arcade games. We became one of the most popular suites at the Toy Fair in New York because the buyers would stop by to take a look at the handheld versions and everybody else would come by to play the arcade games because they were on free play. That was the turtles cake that they gave me for my birthday at Entex because we had done the handheld turtles game. Now, I don't know whether you're aware of it or not, but everything that you see in the other room, all these handheld games had roughly a seven to nine year time cycle, depending on whether or not you admit that 75 was the start or 77 was the start. From 75 to 79, the toy industry was doing classic games, chess, poker, uh, Simon, Simon Says, Gin Rummy, the rest of the stuff. In 78 to 80, we started trying our hands at original games. The toy companies tried inventing their own. We had things like the 3D Treasure Chest that we'll show you up here. We had juggler games. There's a horse race analyzer. And the Follow Me games like Simon and uh, Touch Me from Atari. Between 80 and 84, we started doing the licensed properties like Space Invaders, Pac-Man, and other popular arcade games. Now, why the three cycles? Well, first of all, we started off with something that was a novelty, and everybody turned to what they knew. Now, the thing that you have to keep in mind about the electronic handheld games is that the toy industry got its ideas from these games from three places. Number one, it got them from their internal people. Well, as I mentioned to you, the technology capability or the ability to think about what you could do with technology and electronics within the toy companies was pretty limited. So they turned back to the classic games. And I can remember Tony having books from the library on classic games. And that's what we started with. The other place that we got our best ideas for games was from people like you. We had an open door policy and we used to allow toy and game inventors in every Thursday. We'd sign a disclaimer and we'd review their stuff. And some of our best stuff came from outsiders like Bob McCaslin and McToy, as an example, Rick Dyer, all outsiders. The third place where we got ideas was to license the rights to things like arcade games from somebody who was already successful and then make a handheld version. And we started a trend that you'll hear about here in just a minute. Now, here was Mattel's horse race analyzer. This was an example of something where somebody tried to do something original. Entex started by licensing other people's games and putting the Entex name and logo on them. Now, some of the very first stuff that we did between 79 and 81 were actually called hip pocket games. They were electromechanical. They had LEDs inside of them, but they were mechanical circuitry. And the one on the left, the Alien Invader, which was like a Space Invader game, is those rotating bands. The Japanese were the world-class masters at doing these electromechanical band-driven games. And if you remember the ads in the back of magazines and comic books where if you sold so many subscriptions to Widget Magazine or something like that, you could take your pick of the prizes. These were some of the most popular prizes they ever had. Now, the very first electronic game game that anybody remembers was Baseball One. The game was conceived by a company in Japan called Gaken. And Gaken was a very famous designer. So Tony went to Japan and he made arrangements to license the rights to the game to put our name on it. And we did approximately 30,000 of those games. 
Now, the next year, we came out with a revised version of it called Baseball 2. And you'll notice up on the top that there's a little flap on the top, and that's so that you could pull out a controller and you could have two people play. You could actually have the pitcher pitch the ball rather than having the game pitch to you, and the batter could play down on the bottom. And a lot of people don't believe that these things were done by GAC N, but there's the GAC N version of the game with the control pulled out. And you'll notice that they're exactly the same with the exception of one's in white plastic, the other one's in black plastic, one says Entex, and the other one says GAC N. We didn't invent it. We just licensed it and did it. Space Battle was the first space game that we did. This thing, by anybody's stretch of the imagination, is rinky-dink, and that's giving it a lot of credit. But this was in the days when you could put two batteries of bulb, call it Invaders from Altoona, and people would give you $89.50 for it because it lit up and it made sounds. It was novel. We did about 30,000 of these things. Poker was another game that was popular, and that was offered from 79 through 82. Once again, done by Gak N with our name on it, and we sold about 75,000 of those. Does anybody here have a poker game? Has anybody ever played one of these? Don't bother. It's only got 51 cards. You can't win. <laughs> There's a slight error in the programming. <laughs> Whoops. Okay. Uh, uh, the Queen of Spades, I believe. Uh, so, well, somebody was talking about playing hearts, and they were the programmers had this on their mind, and they had left that card out. I think they were working on a hearts game and the poker game at the same time, and they had set that one aside because if you play hearts, that's 13 points if you get the queen of spades. And I think that's the one that they left out. They just overlooked it. Somebody forgot to stick it back in the deck. We also had blackjack and gin rummy. We sold about 75,000 of those. And these are vacuum fluorescent games. The displays were done by Noritake, the same people who do the fine china. Now, in 1980, we did games for Sears. A lot of people don't remember this, but you'll notice that these are the same Entex games, and they're private labeled for Sears. And they're not only private labeled for them, Sears actually paid for the plastic tooling to have the cases redone as well as the packaging. The electronics on the inside were the same, but these were Sears. There's baseball and the uh, game. You can see the baseball game. It looks like an Entex game, but it says Sears on it. And on the bottom, you can see the logo. This is the, actually the Space Invader game, the original Space Invader case, and the display inside. And this is the Sears version of Breakout. This was blasted. We did this for Sears, and uh, you'll notice up on the top it says Entex, and it says Sears up there on the top. These were more of the games that we did for Sears, and it was great because this particular purchase order propelled us into the limelight. This took... Entex out of the realm of being another Me Too company and thrust us into the forefront as a leading provider of electronic games. Once again, you'll see that here's the, the electronic tennis game and some of the other things that we did. Now, not everything goes as planned. We had our share of duds. In 1980, the first dud we had was called the Dan Van. This was a voice-operated remote control van. We manufactured 20,000 of these and had 25,000 of them returned. <laughs> now, if you say that the math doesn't work out, can you say sent back to us multiple times, boys and girls? The thing never worked. This thing was a complete disaster. Musical Marvin was another disaster. If you remember the logo at Toy Fair, we got them all. Tony had this great idea. He said, let's turn Entex into a one-stop shopping place where they could place one purchase order for any kind of game they wanted. Football, basketball, baseball, tennis, soccer, hockey, and our answer to Simon, which was Musical Marvin. But let's make Simon better. Let's not only make it a follow-me game, with lights and sounds, let's make it a one-octave electronic organ that will record and play back. Never seen that, have you? Uh, that one went away. <laughs> Real quick, did not do well. Okay. Then we decided to produce our own games. The big game was Space Invaders. There were three versions of Space Invaders, and we'll show you what these are. Okay. The first Space Invader game, obviously, it was created by Atari. Everything was designed by Entex Tokyo. The first run was done by a company in Japan called Barashima. 
Tony went to Japan and then to Taiwan in 1980 because the game exploded before they got off the show at Toy Fair. Normally, we would plan on producing 100,000 units. They had sold 300,000 units on the show at Toy Fair. And the cost of having these things done in Japan was high. So Tony said, we're going to take it to, to Taiwan. So he took it to Taiwan to a company called Zenny. They're still in business. They're a very big, powerful manufacturer over there. And we reduced the labor cost by taking the stuff to Taiwan. We produced approximately 800,000 in this original configuration. Then the hammer fall. Legal disaster strikes. But it was averted. Trademark is the mark of your trade. Copyright is the right to make copies. When you violate these, you are violating the federal forgery and counterfeiting laws. Atari sued us for space invaders. They said, you have violated our trademarks and our copyrights. You are capitalizing on our goodwill and advertising. We went to court. The court said it is unclear because the trademark laws have 34 classes of goods and 8 classes of services, and you can have the same trademark in different categories so long as you're not violating somebody else's mark or capitalizing on their goodwill and advertising. And the cloudy portion of it was that one was a coin-operated arcade game, the other one was a hand-operated toy, and it was unclear. So the courts refused to make a decision at that point, and they were going to think on it a while. So we went away, fat, dumb, and happy, figuring that we had it laced. We averted a disaster. And we produced versions two and three of Space Invaders. Now here's where it gets interesting. The one on the left is version one or two, whatever you want to consider, and the one on the right is version three or four. Now I said there's three versions. The one on the left is the original design that uses the Texas Instruments chip. The one on the right was redesigned for us by Rick Dyer and the guys at AMS. And it uses a National Semiconductor COPS chip, a control-oriented processor chip. And it has an option switch on it. You'll notice that the case is different. The option switch is for sound and mute, but it also has motor noise. And the reason for the motor noise was there were not enough output pins on the chip, so they tied the speaker into the oscillator line, and what you hear is the clock inside there buzzing. So we called it background noise and did a little marketing with it. This was really cute. You'll also notice that it's a different version of gray. See, the one on the left you would call black. Well, in a Pantone color chart, that's called a gray, and it's a different color. Somebody transposed two numbers, and when the first production line on the other ones came off, it came off a different shade of gray. That's why it's not black. That's why it's actually gray. The last version has super bright LEDs. Well, actually, it doesn't have super bright LEDs. If you open it up, because you can see it all the way across the room and say, why is it so bright? You'll find a transistor array that I designed to finally, after 800,000 units, bring the brightness up so that it could be seen with the lights on in the room. Uh, this wasn't hailed as widely as I had hoped it would be. The big thing was, we've been doing these for two years. Why didn't you do this two years ago? That's the thanks that you get. Anyhow, this particular game, of course, was by Atari. The case design was by Ortega Orr and Ron Chesley. And... Uh, some guys in Intex Tokyo helped on it too. The electronics were designed by Rick Dyer and his people and myself on the last one, and all the software was programmed by Rick Dyer's people at AMS. Zenny manufactured them. We made 425,000 of this particular configuration between 81 and 83. We made a pinball game called Raise the Devil. This thing was not all that popular, and we got hit between the eyes with one of our inventors, a guy by the name of Elliot Riddell. You may know him. He's a very famous inventor. He's done a lot of things for the toy industry. And Elliot's a born-again Christian, and he walked in one day and saw the devil on this thing, and he went ballistic. It just, we heard him all over. I mean, we had a 165,000-square-foot building, and you could hear him from the front to the back. Uh, the next year... By the way, this was actually conceived by Tony Clues, our president, and it was all designed by Tokyo. It was made by Sailing in Taiwan. We sold about 10,000 of them, and they were available for a two-year period. Now, what we did the next year is we licensed the rights to the Black Knight game from Williams. But this absolutely had no changes other than two things. Number one, well, three. Okay, number one, we changed the packaging from white to black. Number two, we changed the silk screening. And number three, we changed the packaging on the outside. It is the Raise the Devil game. 
Let me back up here. You can see what it looks like there. See the two little buttons on the side and the speed control down on the bottom in the chute? Okay, now look at this one. It's the exact same game. We just repackaged it. Now, in our inimitable wisdom, we decided we were going to turn down something. We had the offer from Dungeons & Dragons to do something, and we decided that Dungeons & Dragons was a passing fancy. So we decided to not take a Dungeons & Dragons license on a pinball game. Instead, we went ahead and did things like the hockey game which Tony can see, we did about 30,000 of those. We had Football 3, which was an improvement over the earlier football games, did about 40,000 of those. And then we moved into LCD games. In 1980, one of the first things that I did was start working on LCD games. And the whole idea was to capitalize on a leading-edge technology. Whether you believe it or not, and all you really have to do is go over across the hall and take a close hard look at it. The toy business was pushing the envelope on technology in the early 80s. We used to display at the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas, and we were considered to be as formidable an entity as anybody else out there because we were using such high volumes of single-chip microprocessors and leading-edge technology that the semiconductor industry wanted to work with us. We decided we were going to do some things with LCDs. And the LCD that you see up here is the road race game. I believe you'll see one on display next door. At the time we did this, this was designated as the most complex LCD in the world. It was made by a company up here in the valley called LADCOR, Large Area Display Corporation. They were making the big LCDs for gas pumps. And I... The name of the gentleman who was uh, their Ph.D. genius escapes me, but he was one of the people that was responsible for the foundation of all the monochrome and color LCD technology in Japan. Very astute individual. The game concept was conceived by a gentleman by the name of Mike Hennig out of New York. His brother-in-law, uh, Dan Schiffman, was the programmer, and the case was designed by Otega Orr, Manufactured by Sailing Industries in Taiwan, we did about 50,000 of these. Now, to give you an idea of what kind of a programmer Dan Schiffman is, after he got through doing toys and games, he was hired by Tandem Corporation to produce a shot key, a high-speed IC version of a single-chip microcomputer. The single-chip microcomputers, at best, had 2,000 bytes. They're anywhere from 500 to 1,000 to 2,000. And the reason that the games were so efficient was because the programmers were so good. You had to be to work with that small an amount of memory. So what Tandem figured was that these things were so efficient and so fast, if they could build a single-chip microcomputer out of high-speed Schottky, 50 to 100 megahertz technology, they would really have something. So Dan actually built Tandem, their backup computers for the airports, out of Schottky based on control-oriented processor systems. The other one was Road Race. This was the very first thing that I ever did for NTEX. And this, once again, was designed by Mike Hennig and Dan Schiffman. And, of course, it's the maze of walls, and there's a crown, a key, and a diamond inside. And I remember when we asked Dan to print out a printout of 1,000 mazes inside, and he did it on an old dot matrix printer. We had a lot of fun with that, and everybody wanted this printout of where the stuff was. Uh, we did about 50,000 of these. Now, once again, the next year, we called a treasure quest, and this is where we turned down the offer to license it under Dungeons & Dragons. Had we have called it Dungeons & Dragons, we probably would have sold a million of them rather than 100,000 of them. But it was the exact same game, just repackaged. If you look at the controls, okay, we did a repackaging job. Okay. We continued on to do our own games. And these were designed for us. Now, this was the Baseball 3 game, and Tony Clues actually conceived the play on this stuff. He poured over classic game manuals, hours, days, weeks, and came up with ideas to make the game play greater. The whole idea was to give people a greater value for their dollar. And Baseball 3 was it. And we sold about 120,000 of these. This was a very popular baseball game. It was LED and the pitcher's... Control could come out the other side. You could play against the game, or you could play against another person. The bike computer we did in 1981. 
This was completely conceived by Tony Clues. This was so far ahead of its time, it is scary. If you look at all the controls, the features, and the functions on this thing, you can go into a Bally's and take a look at one of these cross trainers, and it doesn't have as much stuff on it as we did here. One of the biggest problems that we had with this was because we had all of these controls and all of these functions, the thing had to be big, and big means weight. And it had a a bicycle mount on it that was made out of plastic and as you would ride the bicycle the computer would sort of fade into the sunset but it was really great on a tandem bike if you could weld it on uh, okay Rick Dyer's guys did it. They had a lot of fun with this. It was manufactured by Zenny in Taiwan. We made about 30,000 of them. It was only offered for one year Football 4 was an interesting adjunct. It was at this point that we really started to exploit what they called vacuum fluorescent technology, or FLDs, fluoroluminescent displays, because the LEDs were hard to see, and this was before I figured out how to blast those LEDs and make them bright. Football 4 actually has red and green vacuum fluorescent inside of it, so you could have opposing players in two different colors. Once again, Tony Clues, a uh, brilliant idea, but we only sold about 20,000 of them. Okay. This was our select a game. This was our answer to the cartridge game. And what we did is we put a two-color display in the middle, just like the football four. In fact, I think it was pretty much the same display, and we stuck cartridges in the side. We were trying our hand at this. Uh, that was, once again, conceived by Tony, but we only sold about 25,000 of them. They were not all that popular. We had our share of duds that year, too. This was my most famous dud. This is called Do As I Say. When I went to work in the toy business, I brought with me speech synthesis technology. So at one of the very first board meetings, everybody said, I understand you can make toys talk. And I said, with speech synthesis, I can make the table talk. Why? And they said, well, we could sell talking toys. And I said, what do you want to make talk? And the marketing said, you make a talk, we'll sell it. And I said, okay. So Tony came up with this idea for Do As I Say, and this is a talking Simon game. The voice was recorded by Bob Ridgely, who was a very famous voiceover expert at the time. The voice inside was done using a National Semiconductor Digitalker. We worked with Fred Wickersham up at National Semiconductor. This was the snottiest game you have ever heard in your life. Hey, anybody out there? Are you going to push a button? Or are you ignoring me? Or are you hard of hearing? Plus red, blue, and green. What's the matter? Don't you know your colors? I mean, it was just—it was—it was insulting. It was absolutely horrible. But everybody thought this was going to be a great trick. We didn't have anything that even resembled that case, so we had to tool that case. We made two prototypes for a total cost of two hundred and forty-four thousand dollars. That is the game at Toy Fair in nineteen eighty-one. One prototype was given to Fred Wickersham at National Semiconductor at Digitalker for all of his work on the speech census. The other one went into the cage, and we all went out and got drunk. <laughs> People took a look at this thing, and they said, this is how much? And we said, $79.95, suggested retail. And I'm going to spend $80 to be insulted? Give me a break. We had our share of duds. Okay. We then decided to produce handheld versions of electronic games. Here's the famous Pac-Man. This has been touted as being the best of all of the handheld Pac-Man games. This was one that they did in Japan called Hungry Pac. Didn't make any difference what we called it. The game was conceived by Namco Midway. It was all designed by Intex Tokyo and built by Zenny in Taiwan. We did about 700,000 of them. We also decided to do Galaxian. Notice the emphasis on the words, we decided to do Keep that in mind. It's going to become very important to you here in just a moment. You'll notice that here are some other versions of it called Galaxian 2, Astro Invader, uh, and there's a, an Intex, and uh, somebody else's Astro Invader as well. Nevertheless, these were Namco Midways. Once again, we did about 450,000 of these. Then the legal disaster struck again. But this time, we ate it bad. Midway, on behalf of Namco, sued us the same way that Atari had done. We thought we were going to walk away clean. Didn't happen. 
What the court said was it was still unclear as to whether or not a handheld game was violating a coin-operated arcade game. But something had changed. One of the industry giants, namely Coleco, had felt that it was enough of a violation where they had advanced the sum of $100,000, $50,000 for Pac-Man, $50,000 for Galaxian, to Midway as advanced royalty payments for the rights to use their registered trademarks and copyrights. The judge said it's still unclear, but this time I'm going to issue an injunction. Entex, you cease and desist. We had tens of millions of dollars worth of production in the pipeline, and we were enjoined from doing anything with it. To keep from having to eat that production, we struck an outside deal with Coleco, because they were the official licensee. We actually moved outside the courts, and Coleco basically said, how much profit are you making on each game? And we told them, and they said, fine, give it all to us. And we were allowed to sell the Pac-Man and the Galaxian game through December 31st, midnight of 1981. At that point, all sales, all manufacturing had to come to a halt. And we took all of our profits from these games, and these were sent to Coleco. That was our cost for the settlement. On New Year's Day, 1982, the Entex products came off the shelf, the Coleco products went on, and they sold millions of these things based on all the advertising that we had put out. We were actually the seminal case that started the copyright and trademark violation rules in the toy business. After that, everything was paid for and pre-licensed before anybody did anything. In January of 1982, I went to the Consumer Electronics Show, and I was standing outside the Coleco booth, and one of my associates said, what are you doing here? I said, I want to see how they spent my Christmas bonus, because it all went away that year. Entex then decided to license its games. We licensed Defender from Williams. There's a couple of shots of the handheld game. And we tried some different things. You'll notice up in the upper right-hand corner, there's actually a speed control. We could vary the speed of the clock. We also tried something that people weren't real thrilled about, but it seemed to be a good idea. We had what we called the super lens. We actually put a Fresnel lens, like those things you have in the back of a van's window, on top of it to expand the thing. Really, all it did was blur the image, but it seemed to make it bigger. Once again, this was done by some... Uh, assorted people. The case was done by Ortega Orr, which was in Los Angeles. Entex Tokyo did the work, and we did about 60,000 of these. There was Stargate, which of course was the follow-on to Defender, once again uh, done here. But this one was programmed by Rick Dyer and the guys out at AMS out in Pomona, California. Manufactured by Aston in Taiwan, about 40,000 of them. Crazy Climber, another one that we did. Of course, this was done originally by Nintendo programmed by the guys out at AMS. And if you look carefully up on this one, you can actually see the super lens up here. You can see this sort of contorted image up on the top. About 40,000 of those. Spiders was another one. This one was licensed from Konami, as I remember correctly. Uh, once again, the same team of people doing all the work on the stuff. There's the arcade game Spiders. There was Super Cobra. Once again, the same group again, about 50,000 of those. Odds and ends, you can see that the, the popularity of this stuff was sort of wearing off. Turtles, we wanted a maze game in the worst way. We were ready to go out and beat up groundhogs in the parking lot if that's what it took to get them. So we licensed Turtles. And Turtles became, for its vacuum fluorescent display, the most complex vacuum fluorescent display in the world. One of my engineers, a gentleman by the name of Don Arrowwood, went to Japan and worked with NEC to create some over and under technology to produce that maze game. Once again, it was done by uh, Ortega Orr and Rick Dyer's guys did it. It was manufactured by Aston in Taiwan. About 40,000 of them were actually created. Now, Entex produces some updated versions of classic games. Because we had gotten away with Space Invaders, we didn't want to press the luck too hard, so we called it Alien Invader 2, and we used a vacuum fluorescent in it rather than LEDs. What we were trying to do was sort of retrofit and upgrade with the new technology. This was Super Space Invader 2, which was the same thing, once again, repackaged, but we used the Space Invader name on this one. We just thought we'd press the envelope a little bit here. This was Football 4, which was a color version of the football game. This was two-player. Once again, one of Tony Clue's brilliant ideas that worked pretty well. But we had our share of duds. 
One of them was a tabletop arcade game machine. We only ever produced one of these. It was one prototype at Toy Fair. It was a select -a game machine with a huge LED playing field on it. Didn't go at all. We also jumped into hand or rather standalone video games. Most people don't even know this, but we decided we were going to do standalones. And we produced these cases, and you'll see it up in the upper left-hand corner. And these things are vacuum formed. They are about nine inches by six inches by five inches, and they have a single game inside of them, very crude. And the one on the left was Invaders, the one in the middle was Space Force, which was like asteroids, and the one on the right was Turtles. And we made less than 100 each of these just to test them. They were not popular, they did not work, but we tried our luck. We were trying to get into the video business, and we were actually doing a lot of work in that area. And here's the big one. Here's Adventure Vision. Now, everybody talks about Adventure Vision, but nobody knows where it came from. Okay, and I've saw it called the Holy Grail of handheld games. When I told Don Baker this, he broke up. Okay, let's talk about the players. Adventure Vision was conceived and created by an inventor named Bob McCaslin. If you look up his name at USPTO.gov, you'll find he's got about 25 patents. He has the patent on the Noisy Kitchen and a lot of other toys. Bob had actually created a rotating disc idea, and it was just sort of a fun thing. And in a conversation that we had in the boardroom at Entex, we started talking about something, and the next time I saw Bob, he had the basic concept for Adventure Division. It was a natural progression. He holds the patent on this concept. He has a programmer still working for him today in his new business by the name of Steve Meadows. And Steve is the guy that created all the electronics with the exception of the sound chip inside and all the programming. He actually did all the programming on this thing. Larry Carr and Andy Barber were doing a lot of independent work. They had produced a lot of different things. Most people know them for all their work with Don Kingsborough at Atari. They did a lot of work for Hughes, uh, and they worked on the Hayes modem. Don Baker, as I mentioned, was the project engineer on the gun turret on the A6 gunship, because this thing has a rotating mirror inside of it. And this was the team that we put together. Now, Larry and Andy actually programmed the half-K COPS chip that produces the sound effects. Adventure Vision actually has two chips inside of it. One is to play the game. I believe it's a, a 4048, if I remember correctly, and the COPS chip with a half a K in it. I'll see how good my memory is after 25 years. And here's the famous Adventure Vision. Now, one of the questions that people have is, why is it so hard to find them? First of all, this is the team that worked on them. If you look down on the bottom, you will discover that there were less than 10,000 of these ever manufactured. For as hot a game as it was supposed to become, and for as great as it could have become, there were less than 10,000 manufactured. The reason that I know this is I arranged for the manufacture of the cartridges. There were 10,000 Defender cartridges done, and 1,000 each of the other three. That was all that was ever produced. Yeah, that was all that was ever scheduled to be produced. About the time that Adventure Vision was starting to become renowned in the industry, Entex started having business problems. And the game was pretty much tabled. It was put in the background because of some problems that they had, and it never emerged again. That's why the game never became as popular as it could have been. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the concept of Adventure Vision, let me share with you what it's all about. As was mentioned with the Vectrex people this morning and a lot of the other people that you'll talk to around the game industry, we were looking for ways to produce higher resolution pictures. Atari had done their object-oriented stuff with their 2600, and this was great, but we were looking for ways to do things like they were doing in the arcade games. The CRT concept was abandoned because it was just too expensive and we didn't really want to get involved in that. We tried that with the standalone games. It was too crude. LCD technology as we know it today didn't exist back then. The road race was the most complicated thing that we could do and the game by Milton Bradley that started out with 16 by 16. So we had to come up with something different and this idea of using a rotating mirror and a whole line of LEDs makes sense. And the way it works very simply, you can try this with any kind of a mirror in your bathroom. You notice on your bathroom mirror as you hinge the thing out you see different parts of the bathroom. Well, you can imagine if you spin this thing around the center and have a line of LEDs, if you turn on the lead here and it says A, and then you move the mirror and you turn it on again, it says B and C, D, you can produce the whole alphabet and it's just coming on. It's strobed in time and that's how this thing worked. This rotating mechanism in a plastic base was so critical in terms of timing that we had to hire 
the project engineer off the A6 gunship to design the rotating mechanism. We put a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort into this thing. It actually worked. It could have worked a lot better, but we never got the chance to do it. Adventure Vision has some characteristics that a lot of people probably aren't aware of unless you've investigated the game. First of all, as I mentioned, it has a separate sound effects chip and it has an earphone jack on it, which very few games at the time ever did. Also, over on the right-hand side, if you turn one around, as you go in the other room and look at it, you'll discover that there's an expansion slot on it. We were looking at turning this thing into a home computer because we had our own LED display on it. Well, it had a 4048 and a sound effects chip. What did you want? And a display on it. So we were doing great and wondrous things, and we had great hopes for the future. Unfortunately, the business climate was just not ready for it. But the game itself was way ahead of its time. Now, that's all I've got. What questions have you got for me? Oh, yes, please. Lee you mentioned somebody named Hanzawa. Yes, Hanzawa-san. Is, is that person related to the company? No. Uh, well, okay, I have to qualify that. I don't know what Sunio Hanzawa is doing these days. But back in the late 70s, the early 80s, Sunio Hanzawa was president of Entex Tokyo. We actually opened up an office off the Ginza in Tokyo because we were getting a lot of engineering and a lot of manufacturing done in Tokyo. So it was in our best interest to have stuff done over there. We were doing a lot of purchasing there, too. So I don't know whether that's Hanzawa Corporation. I think it might be. Is that the corporation that was making the little personal computer at one time? It had a little alphanumeric keyboard on it? If so, that was his. I know that the 82, 83, Hanzawa company. Yes, that, that was Sunio Hanzawa's, yes, after he left Entex. Right. Anything else? Gentleman over here, and then back there. Two questions. One is I'm curious about the price points on all of those games back then. What kind of money would they usually sell? For? What price points? Well, they were typically about sixty-nine to seventy-nine dollars suggested retail. As director of engineering, I had to design the cost goal. My cost FOB wherever we had a manufactured was seventeen bucks. That was it. Now we used to figure a baseline of a hundred thousand games. Okay. If you saved a penny, that was $1,000. Back then, my salary was $1,000 a week. If I could save a penny on a game, I could make my salary. Okay. So that's where the price points came from. Now, the price points actually came from the industry. Most of the major retailers carry stuff within a price point. If you want an example of that, go get something like a Radio Shack catalog and look at their radio control cars, and you'll find that they're in a price range. Uh, nothing to ten dollars, eleven dollars to twenty, or something like that. And we were trying for a price point range, and everybody was pretty much in that area. And Tony's brilliant idea, which worked for us, was that if we're going to have the same price as everybody else, let's give them more bang for their buck. So we made bigger games than Mattel, bigger games than Coleco, and we tried to put more features. We tried to put more bang for the buck in them. And the way they used to get more bang for the buck is they used to chain me to my desk and throw breadcrumbs in occasionally, and I could come out when we got the price down and the performance up. And what was the second part of the question? Yeah, I was just wondering uh, what you're feeling for seeing a lot of this technology still on the shelf, given the advances. You're What's my feeling after 25 years? When I was told that I was one of the pioneers and one of the great innovations in this stuff, I fell out of the back of my chair. I said, you got to be kidding. I was building toys and games. What are you talking about? Uh, I think it's great. I really do. Does it surprise me? Yes and no. One of the things that we did a lot of research on over the years, especially when I was working with the gang at Worlds of Wonder on Teddy Ruxman, we did a lot of research on people's minds. And when handheld electronic games came out, the toy industry took a tremendous amount of heat from the academic community. We were accused of sucking kids' imaginations right out of their brains. They no longer played with a cardboard box and some crayons and imagined something. We were giving it to them. Well, the truth of the matter is, is the educational community had been ordered to become computer literate. And they didn't know how to turn them on. They were scared to death of them. And here's little Johnny and Janie, nine years old, and they've learned how to beat a computer that's programmed to beat them. So they were terrified. And we took a look at a lot of what was going on. And one of the things that one of the psychologists said was, when you talk about an action and a reaction, you're talking about a certain number of brain synapses firing. There's a certain number of actions that have to take place. And the more sophisticated you make the computer, the less synapses you have to fire. Now, 
when you look at the early versions of the games, they had simply because we only had rudimentary technology, the ability to play the game, but it didn't have a lot of sophistication. For example, when you go back and you look at some of these packages out here, let's take a look at some of these things here. Uh, the pack- Here, Turtles is an example. I mean, look at the packaging on this thing. Now, in today's technology, you can get turtles that look like that. We have little dots that went beep, 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 and that's a turtle. <laughs> Okay, that was all it was. But in your mind, you had to play. But the gameplay was still there. And you can walk right across the hall right now and see this still same level of gameplay. So am I surprised? No. I watched John make the comment last night. He can actually play the game. See, toys have two rules. You want to write these down and blaze them on the inside of your eyeballs? Rule number one, a toy must be fun. Rule number two, see rule number one. If it ain't fun, it ain't a toy. If it's a lot of work to play, it's not a toy. It's not fun. And a lot of these games, you get the things, and you've got a manual. This comes complete with a discount for a six-year college course and how to turn the game on. That's not fun. So, yeah, that's why people still like to play the stuff. And the gentleman in the back, in the black. Yes? Yeah, you know, I was going to add, I How was Entex formed originally? Uh, Entex was formed in 1969 by Tony Clues. He came from Eldon, and he brought a number of people with him. The original investment group was a gentleman by the name of Nick Carlozzi with A&E Enterprises out of New York, the people that made plastic coat hangers. They put up the original money for the company. A gentleman by the name of Jerry Sachs with Sachs Finley and Company, who specialized in doing brokerage and bartering and overruns, was also a part of it. And Tony had a whole crew of people who were like a mastermind or a brain drain group. Tony had been with Eldon. And they had done the slot cars. They had done very well. And when they got out of that business and went strictly into office products, Tony decided that he wanted to stay in the toy business, so he created Entex. That's where it came from. And he brought a number of the people with him that had been there for years. Yes, gentlemen over here. Um, where are the uh, one-of-a-kind prototypes? Where are the one-of-a-kind prototypes? My wife and I were talking about that over breakfast this morning. I have no idea. In 1984, when Tony had left Entex and gone over to Tomy, the company had actually been taken over by a gentleman by the name of uh, Ken, Ken Klissold. Uh, he had been our VP of finance, and he'd gotten leukemia, gone away, and come back when Tony had left. And he was in the process of trying to revitalize the company, and then Ken got sick again. And Entex actually went up for sale. And Placo, Ron Kesselman, who had been president of... Uh, Ravel and then had gone over to uh, Mattel and Coleco had tried to buy it and they wanted the lock blocks line and the rest of the stuff and at that time we had a cage and the cage was probably half the size of this room it was a bunch of shelves and it was enclosed with chain link fence and we had all the competitive games that we'd taken apart and analyzed plus all of our one of a kinds what happened to it after that I don't know because as you can imagine when the company was being liquidated when Nick Carlozzi decided to get rid of it, I think stuff got thrown into dumpsters, to be perfectly honest with you. I'd like to have some of that stuff myself. Yes, please. What was the suggested retail on the Adventure Vision? What was the suggested retail on the Adventure Vision? Seventy nine ninety five. Once again, this was this concept of design to cost. We had to do all kinds of things that uh, nobody had ever thought of before. We were trying very hard to produce stuff that gave more bang for the buck, but didn't cost more to build. That's why it was such a problem to build the thing. Mm-hmm. Are we running out of time here? Yes, please. Where did the name Entex come from? I knew somebody was going to ask me that. The name Entex was actually an acronym for a couple of things. The only thing that I can remember is the X was considered to be the N because that's all there was. Uh, it was... a Something that was done over a meeting one time with Tony Clues and Nick Underhill, our VP of Marketing, and Jerry Sachs and a bunch of people. Once upon a time, I knew what it was, but it was sort of an acronym for some things that had happened. It didn't really have any super significance. It wasn't the initials of the founders or anything like that. It just had something that happened. But you know where the logo came from. What else? Five, four, three, two. Okay, let me wrap this thing up. I listened to a statement last night that I violently disagree with. It was said that there are no more innovators out there. That's not true. 
25 years ago, I started working with creative people just like you. I literally wrote the book on how to sell your inventions for cash, and it's based on my experience in the toy business. It's been a book. It's a bunch of CDs. We've got them here. Uh, I've done television infomercials. I do seminars all over the world. And the one thing that I know for a fact is that innovation is alive and well and living here in the United States. In fact, it's living all over the world. You just don't see it the way we used to. When a new technology like handheld games starts out, they're relatively simple and a lot of small people can pop up. As we become more and more sophisticated, the industries become polarized and it's a little more difficult to break into the marketplace. There's a lot of creativity and innovation going on, but what the people like you are doing now is rather than starting their own company, they're licensing the rights to their ideas to bigger companies in return for royalty. The first people that we ever really start, saw do it that made a lot of money with in this industry was Activision. That's how they originally started. They would pay programmers a royalty. And I can remember these, you know, 15-year-old kids who weren't old enough to drive a Maserati paying cash for them because of the royalties they were making off their stuff. So the world of creativity and innovation still exists out there today. What I would invite you to do is to take a look at what's been done, what's being done, and remind yourself of a couple of things. Not all the simple toys and games have been invented, and not all the needs of the industry have been met. If you don't think that there's creativity available to people out there, get over it, folks, because it's people just like you with creative ideas that say, gee, wouldn't it be great if we had a game that did this, that, or the other thing that will make tomorrow's game? I'd like to thank all of you. Thank you for coming here today. As you leave here today, drive carefully because the life you save may be a client, and I can't afford to lose any of them. God bless you. We'll see you guys on the floor. Bye-bye. <laughs>